Welcome to week number two of our series, Three Sixteens. And uh, I've got to just give you a heads up this morning. I'm a little bit fired up this morning. Last night, Stacy and I, several of you I saw there as well, were at a concert in Indianapolis, and uh, it was incredible. Uh, Phil Wickham and Brandon Lake, it was, just, it was just two hours of church. And as we're leaving, well, actually three hours uh, of church, and um, uh, the last two hours was my favorite, though. But anyway, uh, as we're leaving and we're seeing the 17,000 people probably leaving the uh, arena and all of the smiles and everybody fired up, I had an idea today. I thought we'd just go two hours this morning as well. Is that, don't turn me off if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. I'm just teasing. We are continuing in our series, the 316. Uh, 316s of Scripture. Last week we learned um, that God loves people and that He demonstrated that by giving Jesus as a sacrifice so that we could be with Him. And we learned that we have to make a choice about that. Are we going to believe that God sent His Son Jesus to die for us or not? And the eternity hangs in the balance. Whether we go to heaven or not depends on that choice that we might make. Now this week we turn our attention to a much lesser known passage of Scripture. Last week was John 3.16, which we uh, know is probably the most famous passage of Scripture. This week we're talking about 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. Now how many of you have that engraved on a pillow somewhere? Probably nobody, right? But here's what Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. He says, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times, and in every situation the Lord be with you all. And so when I saw that passage of Scripture, that was one that I knew I wanted to preach on because I'm thinking in this fast-paced world uh, where, where we're just meeting ourselves coming and going sometimes, we're so filled with stress, we're so filled with anxiety, sometimes we just need that peace. And so I chose this passage of Scripture based on that thought. But then as I dove into the passage of Scripture and the context surrounding why Paul said this, it didn't have anything to do with that. So I was a little bit bummed out. Out, but I do think it speaks very, very strongly to us today. Because here's what was happening. Paul is saying to the Thessalonian church, he's saying, I'm praying for you, church. I want you to have this peace in your life in every single circumstance. All right? Now, if we read the passages leading up to, or the verses leading up to verse number 16, we get a glimpse of what's going on in the church. Paul is writing a letter to the church. Now, you ever notice that Paul usually is writing a letter to the church to kind of get on them a little bit? Usually, it's not. I mean, there's some times where he's saying, hey, you're doing a great job, and, you know, keep up the great work, and that happens in a few places. But most of the time when he's writing to a church, he's like, guys, you need to step it up a little bit. You need to do this better, and, and it makes me think, you know, what would he write to East Columbus Christian Church? You ever, you ever stop and think about that? If Paul were writing letters to this church, what, what would he say? I hope it's not what he says here to the Thessalonian church, because here's what was happening. The Thessalonian church had believers in their church, in, in Jesus Christ, but some of them were being very spiritually irresponsible. What a lot of them were doing was they were speculating about Christ's return, about his second coming, despite Jesus' clear teaching that no one knows the hour or the day when Christ is going to return except the Father. Despite Paul's clear teaching about that, that didn't stop them from really spending way too much time trying to figure out when the Lord was going to come back. And what had happened is there were people in the church who had quit their jobs, they had stopped taking care of their daily responsibilities, and they started plotting these charts and coming up with end-time scenarios about how they think things are going to go. Does that sound a lot like what maybe you see some people doing in our world Today, some people, as, 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 as a friend of mine used to say all the time, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. In other words, they're so worried about Christ's return that they're not doing anything down here. I had someone ask me, they asked me this a lot, are you premillennial or are you postmillennial, right? And so basically what that question is, is like, do you believe the church is going to be raptured out before the millennium or, or, or you know, is the millennium going to happen and then the church uh, be taken out? And so they say, are you premillennial or postmillennial? I say, I'm pan-millennial. 
And they're like, what does that mean? That means it's all going to pan out in the end, and I don't really care, right? Because Jesus is coming back. Amen? When I was a kid uh, growing up in, in Brazil, I heard about a church in our hometown whose minister had predicted the day that Jesus was coming back. And he had convinced his church that he was coming back on this particular day. And he had it narrowed down to a two-hour window. And so they all gathered in the basement of the church. And I don't know why they gathered in the basement of the church. If Jesus is coming back, I'm out on the front lawn and I'm getting excited about it. So that tells me a little bit about, you know, and, and they actually, they had canned goods and all this kind of stuff. I don't know if they thought they weren't going to make it or what. But anyway, they, they had this, this, uh, this time and they're all gathered in the basement of the church and uh, they just waiting for Jesus to come back. And needless to say, preacher was wrong and that small church got smaller because he was then exposed as a false prophet and I'm pretty sure the church ceased to exist not long after that happened and this is what the Thessalonians were doing some of them not all of them but there's some within the number who were playing this game right they were they were quitting their jobs they were spending way too much time thinking about and trying to figure out when Jesus was coming back and and so because they weren't working they were sponging off the members of the church off the other members of the church and and they wouldn't provide for their own well-being and they basically were taking advantage of the kind hearts of people within the church and in the name of Christian love not only were they not um, working in the name of Christian love and figuring out when Jesus is coming back they start meddling in other people's affairs and they're spending their energy in all of this fruitless activity if they were alive today, I'm going to guess that they, they would have quit their jobs and they would have spent most of their day on the internet, maybe playing mindless games, maybe shopping, maybe on social media, whatever, but not doing much of anything else. It reminds me of a guy back in 1988 wrote a book. Actually, it was before 1988, but he wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why the Lord Will Return in 1988. Does anybody remember this? Or, or 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. Apparently, Edgar C. Wisnett, he was a NASA uh, engineer, but was also a Christian, and he predicted that between September 11th and September 13th of 1988, Jesus was coming back. And people started doing crazy stuff because they believed uh, that in this guy's theory, in this guy's predictions, because he was a NASA engineer, apparently a smart guy and a Christian. So they, they, they believed him. I heard about one guy who racked up an insane, um, insane, insane amount of credit card debt. He figured, why not? I'm going to be raptured out and I'm not going to have to pay it. And uh, that didn't pan out too well for him. Uh, probably the best story I heard was a guy by the name of Dave Stone. Dave Stone was, a, was uh, Bob Russell's understudy for several years and eventually took his place at Southeast Christian Church. One day, um, he decided that on, on, on one of the days between that 11th and 13th of, of September that, that the Lord was going to come back, he decided to play a, a prank. He was a student at Cincinnati Bible College and so he worked out a plan with one of his professors that at a certain time in the afternoon, let's just say, I, I don't know, 2.30 or so, I can't remember the exact time, but at this t particular time, the professor would go over to the classroom window and he would open the blinds to the window. And just as he opened the blinds to the window, Dave Stone had hooked a pulley system onto the top of President's Hall, and he had four or five guys with, uh, with a rope standing up there on the pulley, and he had tied the rope to a harness that he was wearing, and just as the professor opened up the window, those guys started yanking, and he went flying up past the window of President's Hall. Now, can you imagine these Bible college students who had been hearing these predictions? It's the greatest prank of all time, Cincinnati Bible College, and this guy just goes flying past the window, and all these Bible college students for just a moment are thinking, oh my God goodness, I miss, I'm left behind, right? But the, these, these Thessalonian Christians were messed up with like real stuff like this. Dave Stone could do this because he knew the truth that no one knows the hour. Only, only God the Father knows when Christ is going to 
return. And apparently there were some within the number of the Thessalonian church that missed that somewhere along the way. And so Paul is warning them, uh, listen, get, get your act together, right? And he's saying in these crazy days of uncertainty, you can have peace in each and every circumstance, even about the return of Jesus Christ. Don't get so worked up over things that in the big picture, it doesn't really matter all that much. Right? We just know He's coming back. I jokingly call myself a pan-millennialist, but I really, I really do feel that way. If He takes me out before things get really, really rough, praise God. If He doesn't, He's given me His Holy Spirit to work through those things and be okay and have the strength. So don't get worked up over it. He says this in verses 6 and, and then again and then uh, 14 and 15. And now, dear brothers and sisters, we give you this command in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stay away from all believers who live idle lives and don't follow the tradition they receive from us. And then skipping down to 14 and 15. Take note of those who refuse to obey what we say in this letter. Stay away from them so they will be ashamed. Don't think of them as enemies, but warn them as you would a brother or a sister. Now, that sounds kind of harsh, doesn't it? Stay away from people like this, right? I think this is what he's saying to us. I think he's saying you need to be careful uh, and, and you need to take care of the relationships. You need to take care of the people that are within your church, right? Paul starts by addressing the entire church about how to treat the irresponsible people among them. He, he begins this section by making it abundantly clear that he's speaking in his official capacity. In other words, he's basically saying, listen guys, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ here. I'm a representative of Jesus Christ. He's not just sharing his opinion, but he's speaking as an apostle of Jesus with the authority that was placed upon him by Jesus himself. In fact, the word command here, it's a military term for giving soldiers their orders. And so Paul couldn't have appealed to any higher power for what he's about to say to these people here in the church. And the people that Paul is talking about here, these idle people, are people who choose this kind of lifestyle, right? They choose the idle lifestyle. He's not talking about someone that's been laid off. He's not talking about someone who is physically unable to work. He's not talking about somebody that's just being lazy for some reason, He's talking about someone uh, who, who chooses, to, actually he's, he's talking about uh, someone who is being lazy. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. He's talking about someone who's just making this choice to be lazy. He's talking about someone who chooses a lifestyle of irresponsibility. And it's important that we understand exactly what Paul's commanding us as the church to do here with these types of people. He's saying, don't have anything to do with them. In verse 13, Paul said, never tire of doing good. So what's the deal here, right? Are those in conflict? I think, I think what we're dealing with here is, and, and it's very important for us to remember this, he wants the Thessalonian church to view these, for lack of better terms, slackers, as Christians, still members of the congregation, don't view them as enemies or backsliders or, you know, just wave a finger at them and, and have absolutely nothing to do with them. But I think what he's doing is he's telling the Thessalonian Christians to just distance yourself from them a little bit. Put some space between you and, and them. Take, put some space between you and the people who are taking advantage of the church. Have you ever been around someone that's taken advantage of the church? Because here's what was happening. We had all of these people within the Thessalonian church who are giving to the church, who are working hard, who are giving of their resources to the church. And then we had a group of people who absolutely chose to do absolutely nothing, 
who are sponging off of the people who are working hard supporting the church. And Paul is telling the Thessalonians, don't support them like that. you got to set up some boundaries between yourself and between people who are choosing this irresponsible path. Paul's prayer is that these boundaries will help people see how re- irresponsible they're being, and hopefully these Christians will come to their senses, and they need to start living a more responsible lifestyle. Paul's not trying to punish them. Paul's not trying to kick them out of the church, but he's trying to get them to come to repentance, to say, listen, there's there's a better way to do things. This is the way you need to do things. And this is so hard sometimes, because as Christians, what are we taught to do? We are taught to give, right? We are taught to help people who are in need. And because of the kindness of our hearts, sometimes we just want to give and give and give to people who are in need. But there comes a point in time where you have to draw that line and you have to, I guess, force people to stand on on their own because people will take advantage. Amen? I remember when I was preaching in North Vernon, and Sandy, I can't remember if you were on staff at this particular time or not, but we had a lady call our church and she was just, you know, telling me what a great, you know, Christian she was and, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's between her and Jesus. But, uh, she said, I'm really struggling right now and, um, struggling financially and, and we don't have what we need to eat and I need to pay the rent and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, what do you, what do you need to help with your rent? And she said, for $650, and she just laid it on thick, you know, just really tugging at the heartstrings, and, you know, good old Ron wants to try to help everybody that he can possibly help, and so I call the elders of the church, and the elders are like, yeah, we'll help her, and so just like that, our church decided to pay this lady's rent for a month, $650. I said, just drive by and pick up the check. We made the check out to the landlord because we didn't want her to be you know, irresponsible. So uh, she pulls up in a brand new red convertible BMW. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's funny now. Uh, It it was not funny then. I mean, she walked in to get the check, and I'm like, "Eh, eh, eh." you know, I I, I didn't know whether to give it to her or not. I, I was just, just got. And, and I feel like, you know, I still today I feel like this lady was totally taking advantage of, of probably not just our church, uh, but several churches. And we need to realize that sometimes if we continue to give grace and we continue to give lovingly to people who refuse to stand on their own, we're, we're enabling someone to continue in this self-destructive behavior. And sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is tell someone no. And and the most loving thing that we can do sometimes is to force someone to stand on their own. When a person chooses to live an irresponsible lifestyle, whether it's refusing to work like what was happening here in the Thessalonian church, or where we we see people who, who have addiction with alcohol or drugs or pornography or gambling, Whatever it might be, there comes a time where we have to set boundaries and we have to say, I'm not, I'm not going to be a part of what you're doing right now, right? Sometimes the most loving thing that we can do is tell someone no, even when it infuriates the person that we say no to. You see, personal relationships in the Christian community are characterized by what, by what we call fellowship, right? Fellowship is a word that depicts mutual relationship. It's both give and take. Fellowship by nature is reciprocal. It's mutual. It's interdependent. But what happens when we have that kind of mutual relationship of give and take when only one person is doing the giving and one person is doing the taking? What happens, right? Or what happens when we have a reciprocal relationship and the only thing the other person is contributing is undermining your faith in Jesus? Can we call those types of relationships really biblical fellowship? If a person who claims the name of the Lord Jesus but chooses to live an irresponsible life that disregards the teachings of Jesus, is that really fellowship? 
I don't think that it is. And then we're faced with this dilemma, right? Spencer, I was just kidding about the two hours. You don't, you, okay. <clears throat> Sorry. He went back to get more songs ready. He, th- he thinks we might need to. Uh, we can't call that relationship true biblical fellowship. And, and so it doesn't mean that we avoid being around that person, but we need to set some boundaries, Right? It, it, it means that maybe we need to distance ourselves a little bit so they, they can't take advantage of it. It means that, you know, we, we just kind of set those, those boundaries up that we, we put our love to the test by refusing to endorse and enable that self-destructive behavior. We still love the person. We still care. We still try to respond to them the best we can when there is a genuine need. But we have to establish these boundaries. Now look at verses 7 through 10. For you know that you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. We never accepted food from anyone without paying for it. We worked hard day and night so we would not be a burden to any of you. We certainly had the right to ask you to feed us. But we wanted to give you an example to follow. Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. I think what Paul is saying to us in this passage of Scripture is this. We need to model diligence. As Christians, we need to be the ones who are modeling diligence. Paul, he's, he's staying in Thessalonica at this particular time, right? And what he could have done, and he would have had every right to do, was to receive a salary from the Thessalonian church. But instead, he goes out and he gets an outside job. He says, I'm not, I don't want you guys to pay me. I'm going to work outside of the church so that I can meet the financial obligations that I have. And we know from the rest of the New Testament that Paul was, some think he was a tin, tent maker, some think he, he was more like a leather worker of some kind. Whatever the case may be, he worked outside of the church to support his own ministry. He didn't want to be an unnecessary burden on the people that he was trying to reach for Christ. Right? But he also used his job as a ministry opportunity. He saw the workplace as a prime place to have biblical discussions. There were times in Scripture where Paul did re- receive financial compensation for working with the church, but here he didn't do it. Right? Here's one of the instances where he refused to do it. And in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonian church, he wrote this in chapter 2, verse 9. Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Night and day we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God, uh, God's good news to you. I think Paul knew. He knew the culture. I think he knew there was a tendency within the Thessalonian culture to become idle, to become kind of like slackers. And he knew that the Thessalonian church uh, would probably be big-hearted enough to support the people who pretended to be in need, right? They, They were supporting these lazy people, and these lazy people were just continuing to be lazy. It kind of reminds me of the guy who said, my business partner is so lazy that if he woke up one day with nothing to do, at the end of the day, he'd still only be half done. Think about that for a minute, right? That's pretty lazy, right? So here's this passage in 2 Thessalonians. You've got all of these people within the church who are not doing what they're supposed to do. And Paul, right, Paul was strategic in his decision to work. He wanted to leave the Thessalonians an example of how to live the Christian life. And so he's providing this discipleship model for the Thessalonian Christians. Here's this living, breathing testimony, this living, breathing example of how to be diligent in being a follower of Jesus Christ. In fact, Paul even laid down a rule. If a person refuses to work, he shouldn't even eat. He shouldn't be financially supported by the church. Now, this doesn't say if a person can't work, It doesn't say if a person isn't willing to work. It doesn't say if a person can't find a job or if someone's going through a difficult time financially where all of these external things are hitting them upside the head. The emphasis is on the word will. Are they willfully choosing to not do anything? Are they willfully choosing not to provide for themselves? And basically, Paul is giving the Thessalonian church permission to cut off these slackers from financial support. 
when people are being irresponsible, our, here's what we have a tendency to do. We have a tendency to really roast them, to chide them with our words, right? And there's certainly a place for our words. But I think what Paul would prefer here, I think what Jesus would prefer here, warn the idle, of course, those who are idle, warn them. But I think what he's saying here is this. Few things work more powerfully and more persuasively than our actions. Right? How we live our lives, our modeling diligence, our working hard for the Lord, I think Paul is saying, and it's my opinion, is that that can be more influential than the words that we say to people. Because we can talk all day long, right? But if we don't back up what we're saying with our actions, who's going to listen to us? And so Paul is saying, listen, I want you to be generous. I want you to, to work hard. Paul had a generous heart. Even though he was never a wealthy person, he had a generous heart. He wanted to give to those who were around. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul wrote, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you had become so dear to us. And so Paul was was very generous, but he worked hard, right? Let, let me ask you this question. Where are you modeling generosity around you? If your Christian friends or if your children were to look at your bank statement or if they were to look at your checkbook, would you be embarrassed by what they saw? Are your priorities clear? The way that you spend your money, the way that you manage your finances, are those God-honoring ways? You know, I think sometimes, you know, I've, I know I've been here at times where it's like, man, I just wish I could be more generous in this area. And then I think back to how many times I ate out last week. <laughs> Have you eaten out lately? <laughs> you know, if you eat out a little less, I'm going to guess you could probably be more generous. And I believe the Bible teaches and I'm just preaching to me right now. If you're with me, then you can say amen if you want. But Okay, nobody. All right, just a second. All right. It's just me and Stacy. All right, very good. Thank you, church. <sighs> I believe the Bible teaches that generosity begins with our financial support of the, of the church that God calls us to, where we worship, where we serve, and then it grows out from there. And when we've been blessed so much. We have been blessed. Amen. We have been blessed in this church so much down through the years. And, and lately it's just been crazy how much God is, is blessing us. But I want to challenge you to look at, at how generous you're being toward God because he's been so generous to us. Are you modeling generosity? Right? And are you modeling diligence? Are you working hard? Paul wasn't afraid of hard work, even if it meant getting dirty, even if it meant his hands were getting calloused. When Paul was financially supported and didn't have to work as a, as a leather worker or a tent maker, I think he worked as an apostle just as hard. Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. Can people see your example of being diligent and being generous? I think that's an incredible testimony that far outweighs some of the words that we will ever say. And then here's the last thing I think that Paul is teaching us. We need to focus our efforts. Sometimes, you know, and this is where I've been lately, and just lately I've let some things go. I've, just this past week I resigned from two different things, and then a month or so before that I'd quit doing something else. So three things just in the last month I just gave them up because it's like I'm just all over the place, and I need to be a little more focused on the things that, that really matter and I think sometimes we need to focus our efforts, right? Here's, here's what Paul is saying. Yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. As for the rest of you, dear brothers and sisters, never get tired of doing good. And so here we find that these idle Christians, they weren't just sitting around in front of the TV watching their favorite shows. They were busily involved in meddling in other people's lives. 
They were sticking their nose into places that they, their noses didn't belong. And all of those efforts, if they just spent as much time working for the Lord as they did meddling in other people's lives, what a difference we would see, right? And the rest of the congregation was putting into their spiritual life, um, they were enabling them to do it. And Paul's saying, listen, you guys need to do a better job of this. Reminds me of the story of, of a guy that wasn't very focused on his energy. Uh, maybe you've heard it before about a man who went out to play golf early one Saturday morning and his wife became concerned because his, her husband had not come home yet at, at dinner time, and it wasn't till about midnight that he came through the front door and he was totally exhausted. And the wife said, where have you been? He said, I've been playing golf. She said, well, that was 13 hours ago. What happened? He said, well, I was having the best game of my life. I was two under par through seven holes. All of a sudden, Harry had a heart attack. Wife was still a little confused. Said, oh, so you've been at the hospital all this time? Said, no, it was, it was really difficult. You know, after he died, it was hit the ball, drag Harry. Hit the ball, drag Harry. It was really, it was really tough. Yeah, I know that's bad, but, but the guy's focus was in the wrong direction. How much energy do we spend on things that really don't matter? Hmm? How many, how many times do we put so much effort into things that in the grand scheme of things, they don't, they don't change anything about anybody's well-being, even your own. Doesn't change anything about someone's eternity. Again, Paul pin, pins on his apostle badge for what he has to say to these people. saying, listen guys, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ by the authority of Jesus. You need to settle down. You need to stop sticking your nose into places it doesn't belong and you need to get a job. Turn off the TV, put the cell phones away, get off your computer. Paul didn't say that. I'm, I'm saying that now. Turn the computer off, turn off your PlayStation, look through the one ads and get a job. Even if it's a part-time job, even if it's a low-paying job. Start working for what you eat, Paul says. And then in verse 13, he broadens the scope again to talk about the entire church. But he says, listen, church, don't get discouraged. Right? So he spends all this time talking about all these idle people. Then he says, don't get discouraged. When, when people take advantage of us, especially financially, our tendency is to grow cynical. How many of us have given money to someone on the corner only to see that person a little bit later in a store buying something they shouldn't be buying with that money? Again, I, I think about the lady in the red BMW. That was 25 years ago, and I'm still talking about it. I'm thinking, let it go. <laughs> you know, our impulse reaction is, you know, well, I'm never giving money to a person in need like that again. Right? Paul said, listen, church, don't grow weary in doing good. Don't get discouraged. Don't withhold financial help from people who legitimately need it just because someone has wronged you. Now, if you, go, if you continue to give to someone who wrongs you time after time after time after time, you, you implement the Gomer Pyle theology, right? Shame me once, shame on you. Shame me twice, shame on me, right? And so don't continue to do that. But when you see someone who has a legitimate need, just because some slacker or some idle person burned you, that doesn't mean you shouldn't help this person. And so Paul says to focus to those who are being idle, focus your attention, focus your energy on getting a job. And to the rest of the church, focus your energy on doing good. Right? You, you who are not doing what you're supposed to do, start doing what you're supposed to do. And those of you who have been helping these who are not carrying their weight, don't get discouraged. Continue to do good. To those who know to do good and they don't do it, the Bible says that's sin. And so I think Paul's saying to us, church, let's focus. Right? Don't get discouraged. Stay focused. And this is what he says, and this is our verse. I've spent 30 minutes now talking about everything that doesn't even relate to 2 Thessalonians 3.16 necessarily, but this is how he ends it. And all this stuff that's going on, may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times in every situation. The Lord be with you all. Lord's with you through every 
single circumstance, whether you're the one that's being idle or whether you're the one that is, you know, maybe being asked to help someone. The peace that Paul's talking about is a peace that also is mentioned in Philippians 4. Spencer, if you want to come on up and, and you guys want to get ready to close us with this song. The peace that, that he's talking about here in 2 Thessalonians, the same peace that he talks about in Philippians 4. When he says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which we don't understand, it transcends our understanding. That peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious. Pray with thanksgiving. And the peace of God will guard your heart. Do you want a guarded heart and a guarded mind? I'm sure you do. Pray about it. Maybe some of you can't relate to what I'm talking about because maybe you've not made that decision yet to enter into a relationship with Jesus. Right now, we want to give you the chance to do that. We're going to offer a song of decision. And if you, if you want to experience this peace for the first time by confessing Jesus and repenting of your sins, if you haven't been baptized into him, maybe, maybe some of you need to do that, like the five that happened last, last Sunday. That was awesome. Or maybe you just, you just need to spend some time praying. God, give me discernment. God, help me to continue to do good. I don't want to be an enabler. I want to be a supporter. But God, give me that discernment. Maybe you've got someone in your life right now that's taking advantage of you. Spend some time praying about that. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And if you have a need this morning, maybe you just need prayed with. Maybe you need to pray to God about some of the boundaries you need to establish in some relationships, whatever it might be. Just would you take care of it now uh, during this time? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for Jesus who died on that old rugged cross for our sins. So that not only could we go to heaven, but Lord, that we could have this peace while we're here living out our days on earth. So that, Lord, we could know how to lean on you and your everlasting arms as we sang about a moment ago. Lord, we thank you for what you've done in Jesus' name.